Thanks everyone for coming to this session on Peter Luther Chartism, the rise of the working class, uh, which gives us a treasure trove of lessons really. This period contains so much inspiring history of the class struggle and the development of working class organisation and consciousness that unfortunately there's so much that I'm going to have to either skim over or just skip over. But I hope that there'll be plenty that we can bring up in the discussion. The main points I want to touch on is the initial impact of Peterloo, but also the development of the Chartist movement, and I'll explain what that is, and their significance for us as Marxists today. Now, this year, on the 16th of August, we marked the 200th anniversary of the Peterloo massacre in Manchester. On that day, in 1819, up to 80,000 people, workers, men, women and children, assembled in the centre of Manchester, what is now St Peter's Square, to demand the right to vote, to demand the right to vote for working men. The response of the establishment and the state was to send mounted, drunken yeomanry with sabres slashing at the workers, men, women and children, and put down this initial movement for democracy. At the end of that day, 18 people, including a two-year-old child, had been killed, and 600 people were injured. It became known as Peterloo after the Battle of Waterloo, which marked the end of the Neapo Napoleonic Wars. Now we mark Peterloo not just because it was a despicable act of murder committed by the British state, which it was, because it was not the first, nor was it the last of these acts. A hundred years ago, we had an even worse ma massacre in Amritsar in India, and those of you who are familiar with the history of Ireland will know of the infamous um, Bloody Sunday Massacre in 1972. That's just two more examples. The reason we mark this event, especially as Marxists, is because it marks a watershed or a turning point in arguably in world history, certainly in the history of the working class in Britain, the first working class in the world. Because here we start to see a generalised political movement of workers setting out to attempt not just to win abstract democratic reforms, which is the starting point, but actually to give themselves the power to change society. Now, the workers' movement existed before Peterloo, existed before 1819. The trade union movement had already <coughs> begun to evolve in underground illegal conditions. There's a famous quote that I'm sure many of you would be familiar with. Marx said that without organisation, the working class is raw material for exploitation. Already, naturally, out of the class struggle, certain organisations were starting to develop. But what Peterloo marks is the first generalised political movement, the development of class consciousness, which is an essential ingredient of the fight for socialism. And this laid the basis, this first emergence put down in blood by the ruling class, laid the basis and marked the starting point for a movement which continues to this day, but found, but culminated in the 1830s too well, as late as the 1850s with the movement of Chartism which Marx described, which produced what Marx described as the first working class party in history. So it's well worth us studying and educating ourselves in this movement. The Russian revolutionary Leon Trotsky actually advised British Marxists to uh, examine and study in other things the Chartist movement, because in his words, he said, over the course of a decade, it gives us in condensed and diagrammatic form the whole gamut of proletarian struggle. And so I'm gonna try in the most concise way I can to, to, to describe that gamut of proletarian struggle and some of the vital questions that were confronted by the movement. Now before I get on to Chartism itself, I'd like to briefly explain the kind of conditions, the context of this movement, which is of course essential for understanding its nature. At the time of Peterloo, and later on in the 1830s as well, we're talking about the, the golden age of capitalism in a way, the early days of unlimited, relentless exploitation of the working class. Workers were being torn from the land, thrown into the dark satanic mills of the Industrial Revolution. And in the hellfire of these conditions, we start to see the beginnings of the class struggle. Of course, the weekend didn't exist. It hadn't been won by the trade union movement at that time. You had instances of workers working every day that God sent. You have, in some cases, 24-hour working. You have women giving birth on the factory floor and then not being able to return to work, or sorry, being forced to return to work only several days after giving birth. We have starving parents selling their children effectively into slavery in the apprentice system, selling them to the cannibalistic mill owners. These are the kind of conditions that existed for the working class at this time. And then politically, the vote did not, in fact, the only people that had the vote 
in the United Kingdom at the time of Peterloo was 400,000 rich landowners. That was it, in a gerrymandered system of so-called rotten boroughs. One brief example is a place called Old Sarum in Wiltshire, which provided to the House of Commons with two MPs and had a population of one elector. Don't know how I managed it, it must have been working very, very hard. This was the kind of situation, they described it as old corruption. At this time, you might have already inferred from what I said, even the middle class, even the relatively prosperous middle class, were without a vote. And so these conditions combined for a mass movement of workers, which also found itself at this time, in these early periods, in a sort of makeshift, sometimes close, sometimes not so close alliance with middle class um, radicals, Democrats, who also wanted to win the vote. Those middle class, uh, I don't know if you can call them Democrats, but the, the middle class eventually won their vote in 1832 in the Great Reform Act, which would later be known in the working class movement as the Great Betrayal. Because despite fighting and dying for the vote, the working class was again left out of the franchise. The franchise was extended now to people who owned a property of £10 or more in value, which excluded the entirety of the working population, who of course owned nothing except their ability to work, which they sold to the mill owners and to the capitalist class. And so from this point on, we start to see the, 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 the threads that are going to be pulled together in this general political movement of Chartism. Of course, I mentioned the trade union movement already existed. After the great betrayal of 1832, it received another shot in the arm. Um, Robert Owen, the famous socialist, returned from his projects in America. Unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about them in any detail at all. But he comes back and he issues addresses to mass meetings in places like Manchester and launches the Grand National Consolidated Trade Union. The first attempt, really, at building a mass national trade union in this country, which at its height had 500,000 members. And the ideas of these trade this trade union was not simply negotiation, and gaining better conditions for working people, the basis of trade unionism, it set about the creation of a new order of things, a socialist society. At the same time, radicals, radical Democrats, people like James O'Brien, an Irish militant um, Democrat and reformer, had drawn the necessary conclusion from the Great Betrayal that the working class and the middle class and the, the class of factory owners had irreconcilable interests, which meant that it could, not, it could no longer and should never really have been allied. Just one quote from this James O'Brien in his paper called The Poor Man's Guardian. He said, these two classes never had and never will have any community of interest. And he actually went as far as to say, without a change in the institution of property, no improvement can take place. These people starting to draw fairly revolutionary conclusions. And this culminates in, um, in the Chartist movement. Now I should explain, what is Chartism? Where does the name come from? The name comes from a document called the People's Charter. Now, the People's Charter was drafted by an organisation called the London Working Men's Association, published in 1838. And the Charter contained six points, all for political reform. And those six points, I'll, I'll quote to you now from, a, from a, a, a pamphlet of theirs. A vote for every man 21 years of age, of sound mind, and not undergoing punishment for crime. A secret ballot, or the ballot, or a secret ballot, to protect the elector in the exercise of his vote so that his boss didn't know which way he was voting, for example. No property qualification for members of parliament, thus enabling the constituencies to return the man of their choice, be he rich or poor. And of course, following on from that, the payment of members of parliament. So a working class person could actually become an MP and be able to sustain himself. That maybe sounds slightly ironic when we see the level of pay and, and corruption of MPs today, but it was very much a progressive demand from the point, standpoint of the working class. Equal, equal constituencies, no more of these rotten boroughs. And interestingly, annual parliaments and I'll, I'll quote this directly, thus presenting the most effectual check to bribery and intimidation, and since members, when elected for a year only, would not be able to defy and betray their constituents as now, which also rings very true to this day. Not that much has changed. Now, as you can see, this is, this is a political document. This is calling for democratic political reforms, and yet what immediately strikes you when you even take a casual look at the Chartist movement is this was inherently more than simply a campaign for the vote. This was immediately a class movement with class demands that got poured, if you like, into the f this democratic shell. You had a socialist content. And I'll give you some examples of what I mean by that. First of all, the Working Men's Association sent out missionaries, and they literally called them missionaries. They saw themselves as almost carrying out the, the task of the early, the acts of the apostles and the early, uh, the early Christians, sorry. And every town and every city they went to and delivered a speech on the principles of the Charter. New political association, political unions they were called, working men's associations, democratic associations, popped up like mushrooms in the night. 
Some speakers like Henry Vincent, who went to the west of England and Wales, went to towns such as Kettering and enlisted 400 people who signed up to the Chartist movement there and then on the spot. It had an immediate, massive impact. And the reason for that, really, was because the demands that were formulated in this charter were already being raised in a more kind of isolated, localised way all over the country. Workers were already starting to strive for a generalised expression of their own interests. And alongside these mass meetings, and we had, we had meetings and assemblies of 200,000 people in Glasgow, 80,000 people in Newcastle, 300,000 people in Manchester, <laughs> and in uh, Peep Green in, the w in West Yorkshire, you had a meeting of tw 250,000 people all listening to militant speakers extolling, yes, the principles of the Charter, but also linking them to class demands. To give you an example of that, I would bring up the example of Reverend Joseph Rayner Stevens. Now, from the, from the name, you can probably infer that he was a religious man. Politically, he was, he was closer to being a Tory than anything else. He didn't necessarily consider himself a socialist. But under the influence of the poor law, the poor law which was introduced by this new middle-class government af after the Reform Act, I should mention, which basically forced people, already forced into poverty by the development of capitalism, by the capitalist system, into prisons effectively, workhouses, that the, work, w the working class called Bastilles, after the political prison of the Bourbon regime in France, where families, men and women, were separated to prevent them from breeding, because the middle class thought that there were too many poor people. Again, that rings true from the discussion we had on overpopulation and climate change. And where basically poverty was criminalised, poverty created by this capitalist system. So this, this Tory reverend sees this and is immediately radicalised, subscribes to the char charter and gives speeches in which he says things like, he points to a local factory, this is an assembly in Kersal Moor in Lancashire, he points to the chimney of the local uh, mill and says, you see yonder factory with its towering chimney, every brick in that factory is cemented with the blood of women and children. Reminds me a great deal of actually Marx's statement that capitalism enters the scene of history dripping blood from every pore. And he went on to formulate, in perhaps the most concise way I've ever seen, the real social character of Chartism. He said, Chartism, my friends, is no political movement where the main point is you're getting the ballot. Chartism is a knife and fork question. The charter means a good house, good food and drink, prosperity and short working hours. Now you'll notice from when I quoted the, the charter itself, it contained none of those things explicitly. But the point is, from the perspective of the working class, the vote was simply a means to an end. Obtaining the vote was obtaining the means, yes, to take control of the government, to make themselves the government, and in so doing, change society. And Engels actually, um, writing about Chartism in the 1840s, he himself actually participated in the Chartist movement, he said, it, Chartism is of an essentially social nature, a class movement. The six points for which the radical bourgeois are the beginning and the end of the matter, which are meant at the utmost to call forth certain further reforms of the constitution, are for the proletarian a mere means to further ends. Political power our means, social happiness our end, is now the clearly formulated war cry <coughs> of the Chartists. And so into this movement is poured, the, uh, is, is poured the, the demands and the desires of an increasingly organised working class expressed in this general formulation. In other words, it's beginning actually to pose the question of power. We see this relationship between the democratic demands and the social demands, which even today actually is obscured. Often you get this idea in the left. Of course, there's, there's the Stalinist theory of two stages where you have to fir first uh, fight for bourgeois democracy and then fight for socialism. But even you know, out outside the question of, of Stalinism, you do see this idea of looking at the vote as almost like an abstract moral demand. Oh, we need the vote because it's a nice thing. And in many of the comm commemorations of Peterloo, it was treated in that, um, that regard. However, for the workers that fought in Peterloo and under, uh, in the Chartist movement, for the vote, they saw it as a means to attaining power. And we see this expressed even further on in the first petition of 1839. Now, the idea was raised, first of all, OK, we have this charter. We want to make it the law of the land. How do we do that when we have absolutely no representatives in Parliament? Now, in the British Constitution at the time, and I suppose we still have it now, I imagine, you could, uh, even though you were unrepresented, re represented, sorry, the subjects of Her Majesty could pose some petition to the powers that be asking them to redress certain injustices. So the Chartists thought, okay, well, we'll put together an immense petition of signatures from all over the country of working men and women. They were campaigning only for work votes for men, but w uh, women took part in the Chartist movement and there were many, thousands of signatures on that petition from working women. And we will present it to them. And what's more, and this is a very interesting development, 
we will elect representatives, delegates, from mass meetings in all of the <coughs> cities and proletarian centres of the country to form a convention to overthrow, uh, oversee sorry, the presentation of this petition. Now, they chose the word convention very deliberately. They picked that word from the Jacobin Convention of the French Revolution. That is the body they wanted to emulate. And, they, um, and so they elected these delegates in meetings of thousands and hundreds of thousands to converge on London, later they moved to Birmingham, in order to present this petition and address the question of, well, what do we do next? It might be said that actually this convention, which was essentially the beginnings of a workers' parliament, delegates being elected by the working class, was elected on a larger franchise and had a larger, a wider democratic mandate than the actual parliament itself at that time, which was elected by about 700,000 people. But already you start to see a divide emerging. A divide, a divide which uh, is both political but also geographical and, and a class <coughs> divide ultimately. Some of you may, may be familiar with the, uh, the, the factions, if you like, the wings within the Chartist movement of the moral force Chartist and the physical force Chartist. At the convening of this convention and in the run up to it, we start to see this divide emerging quite, uh, quite clearly. On the one hand, the London Working Man's Association and its paper, the London Dispatch, was part of what you'd call them, I suppose, the moral force faction you can call it that. The moral force faction put forward the idea that the, the purpose of the petition is to mobilise public opinion and when the powers that be in Parliament see that public opinion is dead set on this certain goal, will be forced, would have to um, accede to the request because it can't go against public opinion. That was the idea. Whereas the other wing of the movement, if you like, epitomised by the Northern Star, which is a paper set up by the physical force Chartist leader Fergus O'Connor, again another Irish militant, former barrister who then committed his life to the Chartist movement. They advocated a, a, a different purpose. They were, they were perfectly f uh, fine with putting forward a petition, mobilising public opinion and so on, but they believed that without the force, without the ability to back it up, without the threat of physical force to even overthrow the government or force it to accede to its demands, no ruling class would ever do as it's told effectively. Um, one, one Chartist, uh, Robert Gamage, who, uh, who actually wrote a book on the history of Chartism, explained that what is government itself but physical force? Every government is based on physical force and no ruling class has ever simply given up its power and privileges without the threat of force. This kind of uh, movement, this wing of the movement, was concentrated in the proletarian heartlands of places like Manchester, the West Riding of Yorkshire, and the coal districts of South Wales and parts of Scotland. And you could see the kind of the class content of this on these mass demonstrations where you had banners being carried with the skull and crossbones on a black flag with slogans like tyrants take heed or Ashton demands universal suffrage or universal vengeance or another one saying remember the bloody deeds of Peterloo. One thing that we have to remember is sometimes when we look back on it in history, we think of moral force and physical force as being these equal sides in the movement. The very relative strength of these sides depended on the development of class struggle in, in, you know, over the course of this movement. And at this time, the physical force Chartists had an overwhelming majority in the movement and in the convention. And wherever, in the most kind of developed factory areas and where the proletariat was thickest, the physical force demands were also the most uh, extreme, if you like. Also, in the East End of London, the Democratic Association, led by um, Julian Harney, was, uh, if you like, on the extreme far left of this movement, calling directly for insurrection. So this Workers' Parliament convenes and, the first, uh, and, and presents this petition. The petition was pre presented, presented sorry, on the 14th of June by the Chartist Thomas Atwood, and it managed to uh, gather 1,280,000 signatures. By the way, online petitions did exist at this time. This was literally pieces of paper that people had accumulated from every part of the country, slapped onto a giant roll and carted into a parliament at the head of a procession of tens of thousands of people. The next question that arises, the debate and decision in parliament wasn't going to take place until the 12th of July. So the decision for the convention, which is now a sitting workers' parliament, is what do we do in the event that, that parliament rejects it? One small minority said, well, the convention should now dissolve having presented the, part, the petition because all it's supposed to do is, is just present public opinion. That was rejected and that small minority immediately left the convention, thus meaning it shifted even further to, to the left, if that term is appropriate here, to the physical force faction. A resolution was eventually passed that if the petition were rejected on the 12th of July, the only way forward to force the Charter to become the law of the land 
was to adopt what they called ulterior measures. Those measures included things like organising a run on the banks, which would have been interesting, uh, um, the exclusive dealing, which meant only buying things from shopkeepers that actually supported the cause, arming, and a universal secession of labour, or what, you might call, what they called a sacred month, or grand national holiday. Mm. In other words, this Workers' Parliament resolved that if the actual parliament, the ruling class parliament, the dictatorship of capital, did not agree to reform itself, they would start on a month-long general strike in which they were arming and training workers. In other words, this, this was preparing for and calling an insurrection. This makes another point that not only was Chartism more than simply a political democratic movement, it was a class movement, it was also, at its essence, a revolutionary movement, which is something we really need to hold on to in this country because I've spent my whole life being told um, from historians and from the media that there is no revolutionary tradition in this country. Okay, we had the English Revolution, that was a bit of a mistake, chopped the king's head off, whoops. <laughs> but in terms of the history of the working class, the working class is genetically coded to be gradualist, a bit liberal to be honest, very reformist, and all very calm, stiff upper lip, all this kind of thing. Now there's a grain of, grain of truth to every lie, and I'll come on to that question, but here in the history of Chartism we, we see the, the, the real revolutionary history of the British wor uh, working class. So long story short, Parliament unsurprisingly rejects the petition. In the debate, Lord John Russell, a Whig M uh, MP, the Whigs would eventually become the, the Liberals, the middle class party, said that universal suffrage could never be passed because it would necessarily mean the equalisation of property, the robbery of the property from the rich to give it to the poor. He also said it would lead to the abolition of the monarchy in the House of Lords. Those demands weren't in the Charter, but he was reading into it exactly what Engels read into it later. Engels said that the six points of the Charter, he wrote this in 1848, would be sufficient to overthrow the Queen, the House of Lords, and the whole of the British Constitution. It's very interesting to see, it's not the first nor the last time that the ruling class were drawing the same perspectives as the, the Marxists. Anyone who reads the Financial Times today can see elements of that. Uh, it also is a great rebuttal of the historians who today say, no, it wasn't a revolutionary movement. The ruling class certainly thought so. And it was rejected by 237 votes to 48. So what are they going to do? Thomas Atwood, who was a moral force charter, said, let's have another petition, an even bigger petition. James O'Brien replied with quite a ritty reply. He said, you may as well send a petition to the Rock of Gibraltar. It'll get a, the same result. But then we have the question that of this workers' parliament, which is effectively <laughs> laying the foundations for, it, it, it's a precursor to a Soviet, really. I don't want to be too, I don't want to overemphasize things. But what we, we have is workers' representatives being elected to change, to overthrow the constitution and change the law of the land in opposition to the bourgeois state. What's it going to do? It's said we're going to have this month-long strike. And the date, in many areas, in, in Manchester in particular, the call was coming out, name the date. They were ready to go. And the date was set for the 12th of August, a month-long secession of labour. But at this point, we see the, the, the question of the general strike. And I think there's a discussion on the 1926 uh, uh, general strike going on right now, which will address the same thing. A general strike of this nature, an all-out general strike for as long as a month, it poses the question of power, especially in the context when you have extreme deprivation an increasing militancy in the working class areas and an elected workers' parliament trying basically to force the bourgeois state to do its bidding. What we're really talking about is the working class saying to its, its bosses, its rulers, everything that happens here happens because of us. Not a wheel turns, not a light bulb shines without the kind permission of the working class. We are the ones that run here, things here, which is of course revolutionary, but it's effectively also a declaration of war against the existing order. Something that the ruling class, again, fully understood because they set about arresting all the Chartist leaders as quickly as they could. Now the Chartist leaders, mistakenly or not, ha started to have doubts about whether they'd be able to carry this off. They wondered whether the strike would hold out and they worried about the bloodletting which would ensue if they actually carried it out. So under this pressure they reduced it to three days and then out of gratitude the bourgeois state arrested every single one of them or any that they could get their hands on. And so this, this movement petered out for a time. But here we also see another question being posed, one that we can learn a great deal from and must learn a great deal from. That just because the leadership has been decapitated or the leadership has retreated does not mean that the burning rage and desperation and, and revolutionary consciousness that has developed below suddenly just dissipates. And we see this again in, in 1926, but that's not what this talks about. That the situation at that time, one delegate to the convention reported in his area, I think he'd come from Manchester, the deprivation and starvation because of unemployment was so um, terrible, that one mother had had so little to eat that she'd ceased to produce milk and she was nursing a child and when the child tried to feed from her breast all it drew was her blood. 
That was the situation that existed for the working class at that time. They weren't going to just go back home. And what resulted from that was um, the, the heroic but tragic insurrection of Newport in 1839. We're actually days away from the 180th anniversary of this, um, again, watershed in w British working class history. On the 4th of November, um, ten, uh, up to 10,000 working men who'd armed themselves with guns, homemade pikes, basically like a big spear, and, uh, and their tools like pickaxes, assembled in order, this was not a drunken rabble, this was basically military formation, and decided to march into the town in order to free one of the arrested Chartist leaders, a man named Henry Vincent. They marched in formation into the town. They were met by police and special constables, kind of like the B specials in the north of Ireland, basically you know, temporarily hired thugs for the state. They repelled them by force, and these people fled into the nearby Westgate Hotel, where there were soldiers waiting, and from the shelter of the building, fired on the, the insurrectionists, killing 10, and dispersed them. And with this, this heroic attempt to take matters into their own hands is, is dispersed and defeated. Now, subsequently, some historians have tried to claim it was basically just an ad, act of madness, a riot. But I think one witness of this can tell us a great deal about the intentions of this movement, that this wasn't simply an isolated act of desperation, that many of the people who took part in the Newport insurrection considered it to be the beginning of a nationwide insurrection. And actually, insurrections were being planned and even were attempted in places like Sheffield and Bradford. Now, the, the, the witness that I'd like to call to the stand is a chartist by the name of George Shell, who's an 18-year-old worker who set out to take part in this insurrection. He left a note to his parents in which he said, Dear parents, I hope this will find you well, as I am myself at this present. I shall this night be engaged in a glorious struggle for freedom, and should it please God to spare my life, I shall see you soon. But if not, grieve not for me. I shall have fallen in a noble cause. Farewell. He died in the course of that attempt at insurrection. John Frost, who was a, a leading chartist who, who led that insurrection, well, as you should have mentioned earlier, and other leading chartists like Zephaniah Williams were arrested and charged with high treason. But another interesting thing happens. At the trial, they are convicted of high treason. High treason is pretty much the most serious you can, thing you can do as far as the bourgeois state is concerned. They're, con they're sentenced to being hung, drawn, and quartered. Now, does everyone know what that means? It's a particularly creative medieval punishment where you're hanged by the neck, <coughs> you have your bowels torn out, and then eventually they cut you in quarters for some reason. I don't know why they do that last part. It seems a bit over the top, to be honest. They, they, these people were the last people uh, sentenced to being hanged, drawn, and quartered in the country. But the wave of revulsion that followed that sentencing, and a petition, even bigger than the first one, of two million signatures, meant that the establishment actually backed down and commuted the sentence to transportation for life, a much softer sentence than that, because they worried that if they carried it out and made a public display of martyring these people, then they would, what would they, they would have seen was Newport replicated across the entire country. That's how revolutionary this period was. This is, I think the situation hinged, basically, on a knife edge. But with, this, with the defeat of this interaction, the first phase of Chartism um, comes to a close. But often, the, the case is that the working class often learns through defeats. And the class struggle, sadly, contains more defeats than victories. But we see developments in organisation and class struggle and, and uh, consciousness sorry, as a result of this process. And one incredible step forward, which is made, again, from experience, is the formation of the first working class political party in history. The defeat of the convention and the insurrection demonstrated in practice the need for a national organisation to coordinate. One of the problems, obviously, the fact that communication was much more difficult at this time clearly plays a role. But the hope of the insurrectionists in Newport was that that would be followed by workers across the country. What certain chartists like Fergus O'Connor drew from that was it would be necessary to have a party in order to coordinate, in order to generalise and lead and direct this movement. That party was formed in 1840 at a conference in Manchester, and it was called the National Charter Association. And it was a political party of the working class. It had subs paying membership, the, first, the subs were initially two pence a quarter, which for starving workers was a genuine sacrifice, used to pay where possible a full-time secretary and an apparatus. You had an elected executive, you had branches, branch meetings that also put on discussions, lectures, Sunday schools for children, <coughs> and it even also had a, an unofficial organ, the Northern Star, the paper that I mentioned. Um, effectively, it, it almost was the iskra of its day, and what I mean by this is that it carried reports of Chartist meetings, assemblies, um, of uh, strikes, of reports from class struggles everywhere, and polemics 
on all the key tactical and theoretical questions of the day. It's, it, it contained many of the, the elements that Lenin would later write about in a more theoretical sense, the need for, for a, a worker's paper, basically, as, a, as an organiser. It contained these instinctively through practice already. It was, it was the property of Fergus O'Connor. It wasn't owned and directly controlled by, uh, by the party, which we see now as a limitation. But we see already this, this moving towards, um, towards a, a new form of organisation. And it actually, uh, at its peak in 1842, it had as many as 40,000 members and 400 branches across the country. Bear in mind this is a party that doesn't just stand for work, votes for working people, but stands for the <coughs> physical overthrow of the government if it doesn't grant it. This is a mass revolutionary party in, in, in the United Kingdom. And the line it took actually contains many um, lessons for us today. People talk about this period as if it's another planet, that we can't learn anything because, I don't know, we're more civilised now or something like that. It's actually not the case at all. We can learn a great deal from the position the Chartists took because they took an independent working class position to some of the great questions of the age. One such question was the question of the Corn Laws and free trade versus protectionism. I don't have time to go into detail about this question, but the Corn Laws basically banned or regulated or set tariffs on the import of foreign corn meaning the price of British corn was artificially high, and so the farmers and landowners basically took, a, took a, a nice big cut to sustain their riches. This is something that enraged the middle class manufacturers because it raised the pre price of bread, therefore raised wages, and also set limits on their ability to trade, which they don't tend to like. That meant that they had their own political movement to repeal the corn laws, but of course it also meant that the workers were suffering because of the higher price of bread. And in the, the 1840s in particular, the Anti-Corn Law League, which is a bourgeois movement repeating the Corn Laws, started making overtures to the working class, saying, suffrage is one thing, we can talk about that later, but if we repeal the Corn Laws here and now, your living standards will immediately improve. So join with us, repeal the Corn Laws, lower the price of bread, and then, and then let's talk later on about political reform. Where have we heard this before? I have to say that, there's no, I need to be careful that there's not, I don't want to crudely suggest it's exactly the same thing, but today we also have a split in the ruling class about its trade policy and how best to exploit the working class in the form of Brexit. I'm not going to crudely say like one's the free trade side and one's the protectionist side, it's a bit more complicated than that, but you effectively have two wings of the ru ruling class reaching out to the workers and saying, join with us. It's, it's free trade for the workers, it's Brexit for the workers. What was the position that Chartism took on, not the question of Brexit, but the question of the Corn Laws? It took an independent class position, which can be formulated very simply. It was free trade and the repeal of the Corn Laws is, is all good in the abstract, but without the Charter, it will only mean worse conditions for the working class. First the Charter, and then we'll talk about the repeal of the Corn Laws. And what does the Charter mean? It means first power, and then when the working class has control of the situation, they will decide how best to repeal the trade laws, and that way the workers will gain the benefit of that if there's any benefit to be gained. Instead, and charter speakers from the NCA went to anti-corn law meetings, put forward resolutions and amendments calling for the charter, explaining that actually, if we uh, repeal the corn laws, then the price of bread will lower, but also so will wages, and you'll be exploited all over again. Which again, is, this is moving towards a, a, a kind of a, a, an instinctive beginnings of Marxist economics in a way, based on working class <laughs> experience. And they carried them. They won over anti-Corn Law meetings on the basis of their arguments. In fact, the Corn Law League actually had to stop, uh, start having to ticket the event to stop Chartists from getting in. They were winning the argument. They stood in elections, in elections where no working uh, class person had the vote. You might think that was a stupid thing to do. But in those days, before the ballot, you had a show of hands vote and then a vote by poll of the actual uh, qualified electors. And so Chartist um, uh, candidates would go onto the platform, expose the lies of both the Tories and the Whigs, put forward a working class uh, proposal for the Charter, and in many cases would win on the show of hands. Of course, the people who showed their hands didn't necessarily have the right to vote. And so those candidates would either have to withdraw or they'd usually lose by a very large margin when it actually came to the poll. But of course, the political impact that's making, the demonstration of just the complete lack of democracy was very powerful. Um, there are many other things that I could say about the NCA, but I do have to hurry up. Now, the, that, this culminated in a second petition. A second petition was drawn up and submitted in 1842. That petition managed to gather over three million signatures. And there's another special feature, not just the size of the petition, but also the nature of it. It wasn't the same. It didn't have just the same wording as the first petition. Now, in addition to the six points of the Charter, it contained explicitly demands like getting rid of the national debt, saying it was basically just the people paying the capitalists, it usurious its rights of, of interest, abolition of the poor law, um, the uh, 
the abolition of the Metropolitan Police, which they believe was unconstitutional. I haven't seen any Supreme Court overturning that. That would be good. For shorter hours, for higher wages, they even called for the repeal of the Union with Ireland. They were calling for the, legis uh, the, the liberation of Ireland, basically, from British imperialism. This led uh, Marx to believe that the victory of Chartism was the way in which we, we could see the liberation of Ireland. That instinctive internationalism of the working class, which again is often buried when historians talk about the history of the British working class, is there on clear display. And this petition garnered three million signatures when the population of Britain and Ireland together was about 25 million. This is an enormous petition. It was so physically enormous that they couldn't even fit it through the door of the Houses of Parliament. First they tried to take the door apart, and then when they couldn't do that, they had to take the whole petition apart and present it in some, it was like something from Alice in Wonderland, it was a just giant tower of paper in front of the desk of the, the poor people who had to read through it. Now unsurprisingly, that was also rejected by more or less the same margin. <coughs> One MP by the name of Macaulay said, universal suffrage amounted to nothing short of the confiscation of the property of the rich and the end of civilization. Of course, his civilization, yes. He said civilization is based on private property, which isn't wrong, but very, uh, you know, proceeding angles. And, and therefore, universal suffrage for working men who will naturally want to confiscate and expropriate the rich would mean the end of civilization. This shows how insightful the, the bourgeoisie were at this time. It also shows the class nature of the political demands of Chartism. It's rejected, but again, with the rejection and defeat on the political front, the workers move rapidly into an extremely militant plane in the industrial front. And what we see in 1842 is the so-called plug plot, and I'll explain what that was. In early August, manufacturers in, in, in Lancashire started cutting wages, uh, as they do. The response of the working class was to come out. And so in the first mill, when, the, when workers left the factory on strike, they walked down to the next one down the road, said, we're coming out, called the workers out who joined them, and eventually you had processions of thousands of workers starting to arm themselves as well, going from factory to factory and saying, we're shutting this down. And if the boss said, no, you're not, they'd wrench out the giant plug that kept the, because obviously there was a steam power, they pulled the plugs out of the boilers so the factory couldn't even operate. That's why it was called the plug plot. Eventually, this culminated in Manchester and a 50 mile radius around the city being at a complete standstill. Now that's a big thing in and of itself, but Manchester was the beating heart of British industry at that time. And it spread beyond the Manchester, Lancashire area. It spread to Staffordshire and the Potteries. It spread to West Yorkshire. It spread to, excuse me, the, the coal fields of South Wales and, um, and, the, 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 and, and in Scotland around Dundee. The vanguard of the working class, basically, was all out. And now an important question arises, which was explicitly put to the movement. Is this gonna be a strike to increase wages, which is how it started, or is it something more? And the strikers held a conference in Manchester with over 300 delegates, 358 delegates, on the 12th of August, to decide on this question. And of those 358 delegates, 320 voted, again, workers' representatives, in, a, in an embryonic Soviet, if you like, a strike, a gigantic strike committee, decided that this strike was gonna stay out until the charter became the law of the land. So from an, a spontaneous response to the bosses cutting wages, this became a perhaps not entirely nationwide, but certainly not simply a regional, an almost nationwide, all-out general strike for the overthrow of the British Constitution, a political strike. It reminds me of May 1968 in France. We had Renault workers and, and workers on strike shouting, gouvernement populaire, popular government, workers' government. This is what we see in 1842. <laughs> but the problem is, what was the role of the NCA? The, the NCA, the first workers' party in history. The NCA did not predict this. They did not lead this sadly, and actually when the strike first broke out, the Chartist leaders, like Harney, who was himself was, was on the extreme left, they said, no, you shouldn't, because this will provoke a confrontation we're not ready for, and it will end in bloodshed. Now, they later saw their mistake, and they, they issued a proclamation in support of the strike, for which they were rewarded with being all arrested again by the British state. But this effectively left the movement without leadership. Spontaneously, the workers had organized and come out, and, were, and again, posing the question of power directly to the capitalist state. But without a clear, Engels explained in his book, The Condition of the Working Class in England, in 1848, he explained that the workers had shown that they were able and ready to come out and change society. But in his words, if it had been in, from the beginning an intentional, determined working men's insurrection, it would surely have carried its point. Because it didn't have a clear aim, because it didn't have this organized leadership that could also help to spread the strike across the country, it reached a point of perhaps not paralysis, effectively became stuck. And in the face of increasing repression, 
eventually the workers had to go back to work. The wor as we know, the working class can't simply stay out on strike indefinitely without a clear aim in mind. And again, an historic opportunity was lost. Now it's easy for me, many, many years later, to say, oh, they should have done this, they should have done that. What's, what needs to be remembered is that this was the first time that this was being carried out in Britain. In, in, in many examples, this was the first time this was being carried out in the world. And after this, after this high point, we see ch the Chartist movement begin to go into decline. It has some successes. Fergus O'Connor was actually elected as an MP, even though the Parliament wasn't reformed, in 1847 for Nottingham. We also see another petition being presented in 1848, off the back of a revolutionary movement across Europe. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that year, the year the Communist Manifesto comes out, the year of the French Revolution in, in February 48, German Revolution. British Chartists were watching foreign, affair, foreign events. They gave solidarity to revolutionaries in other countries in Europe, and they sought to link their movement to their own. But that petition was again rejected. It claimed five million signatures. It's, it's believed that really the genuine number was about two million, still an immense petition. But the, the movement eventually fizzled out, if you like. There's more that can be said about this period of Chartism. I'm not doing it full justice, but I, I'm already running out of time. But the, the NCA continues to exist, continues to be a, a party of thousands of people. And actually, I, I now want to talk about the, uh, yes, we, we see kind of the decline of Chartism. I should mention that after the disappointment of 39 and 42, people start moving to other movements. The Corn Law, anti the repeal of the Corn Law movement starts to become increasingly popular. The tables are turned, if you like, unfortunately. You have uh, movements to educate the workers, teetotalism, cooperativism, all of which have a place in the workers' movement. But of course, as O'Connor explained from the NCA, without the pursuit of power, as long as the capitalist establishment continues to exist, these movements can be isolated and they can ultimately be frustrated, which is, of course, what we've seen in the cooperative movement today. But these start to gain popularity at the expense of Chartism. And so people, many people following this have said, oh, well, Chartism has failed then. It eventually it resulted in nothing. They didn't win the vote. The vote was delivered by a, a, you know, a Liberal government in 1867. Therefore, Chartism was a failure. I don't think that's right at all. As Engels pointed out, Chartism effectively changed, changed British history and even changed British culture. The ruling class was so terrified by this revolutionary period, by the threat that Chartism posed, it began a policy of offering cons concessions where and when it could in order to keep the workers on a, on, a, on a looser leash, if you like. We're also talking about a period in which British manufacturing, British capitalism was at its most powerful, most successful ever in the 1850s and 60s. It dominated the complete, uh, completely dominated the world economy. It was able to provide an, inc an improvement in living standards for a layer of the working class. And on that basis, uh, uh, the trade unions, of course, became a bit more uh, moderate as a result of this improvement in conditions. And so the, ru the ruling class was felt able to introduce concessions. But there's an important point to remember here. They didn't just introduce the vote because conditions in improved. They introduced the vote when they did because Chartism was already dead. The, Charters, the National Charter Association effectively ceased to exist in 1857 when, it, uh, when Ernest Jones, who was, well, I'll get on to him, but when the leadership decided to enter into some kind of al allegiance with the middle class. If there had been a Chartist party still there, if there had been an independent working, part, a working class party, even of a few thousand who were putting forward these kind of ideas, then the ruling class would never have introduced the vote because <coughs> it would have inevitably meant that this party would have great successes and that the, the kind of risk that they were talking about, the risk to civilization, would be posed again. Chartism had to be dead and buried before they could risk introducing the vote. It also shows, I, I said about... Um, without organisation, the working class being raw material for exploitation. That applies politically as well as economically. That without a party, the working class can simply be used and abused as a reserve for the various work, uh, ruling class parties. We see this in America to this day. But that vote was won by the threat that Chartism posed. It was fear of revolution from below that caused the ruling class to introduce these reforms from above. But there's another very important product. Maybe it's not right to call it a product, but an effect of Chartism. As I mentioned, Engels wrote about Chartism. He lived in Manchester. He associated with Chartists. He wrote, both Marx and Engels wrote letters and articles for the Chartist press. Marx actually spoke at a Chartist meeting in English. He went and gave a speech in English, a Chartist meeting, and then insisted that they don't publish it. I think maybe he was a bit worried about his English, but it, it would have been amazing to, to, to witness this meeting. They, they were basically a part of the Chartist movement, and they had very close relations with Ernest Jones, who was kind of the leader of the later period of Chartism, from about 1848 onwards. He was the leader of the National Charter Association. And they tried to, and had some success in winning him over to their ideas. And likewise, many of the demands of the Chartists, you will recognise from the kind of demands that were being put forward in the Communist Manifesto. 
1864, the International Working Man's Association is founded. Where did they get the name from? It, it sounds remarkably similar to the London Working Man's Association. Many of the lessons and the programs, the demands, the concrete demands of Marxism were taken from Chartism as this first living experience of the masses of workers trying to change society. Of course, the pr actual program of Marxism is generalised from the experience <coughs> of the working class. This is where we get the power of our demands from. And we can see this in practice, which makes Chartism such an essential movement to study. But finally, the last point that I want to, uh, that I want to end on is what, what's left of Chartism today. That Trotsky made a very interesting observation about the British Labour movement. It effectively has two souls, or two sides to it, should we say. I would say that contrary to the slander that's carried about the British working class, that it, it, it's innately conservative or gradualist or, or reformist, which is something introduced by the reforms of the later period on the corpse of Chartism. That's not the real face of the workers. The real face of the British working class can be seen in events like the Newport insurrection, the plug plot, the attempts of the Chartists to put power in the hands of the workers. That's the real face of the British labour movement, which still exists to this day. But there's another side to this movement. Every creature has a face and a backside, and the British labour movement also has a backside, and that is the liberal leadership, often that you get of the right wing in the trade union and labour party, that see their role to effectively put forward, if you like, a, a form of the moral force arguments to win round, to be respectable, and will win round the bourgeoisie to give them some kind of reforms. This, if you like, is the backside of the labour movement, and as we know, uh, well, maybe the zoologists in the room can correct me, but I'm not aware of any creature that can move backside first and end up where it wants to go. As I know that's certainly not the case for human beings. This true face of the working class, which has been obscured by the betrayals of the right wing of the movement many times, we should make it our task as Marxists in Britain to bring that real face to the fore. In many respects, I think we can lay claim to the heritage of Chartism, the real inheritors, the, re the, the people to whom uh, belong this tradition of Chartism can be found in the bodies of the Char British uh, Marxists to this day. We should reclaim this heritage of Chartism, this revolutionary Marxist wing in the British Labour Movement, which was present in the Labour Party, which is present in the trade unions, has always been present as long as Marx has existed. It is our duty to take this movement, the first seeds of which were sown at St. Peter's Fields in Manchester, and carry it to victory. And on that, I'll just finish with the words of the poet Shelley, writing about Peterloo, I felt would be appropriate to finish on. Rise like lions after slumber, in unvanquishable number. Shake your chains to earth like dew, which in sleep had fallen on you. Ye are many, they are few. Thank you.